my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown Oh that old rugged cross so despised by the world has a wondrous a traction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory above to bear it to dark calvary so i'll cherish the old rugged cross tell my trophies at last i lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see for twas on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory for So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown There is a name I love to hear I love to sing its word Earth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. 
It tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. It tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe. Oh, who in his sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Because he first loved me. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You know, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to start... Um, Looking at um, at the Gospel of Matthew a little bit, and if you're familiar with uh, Matthew chapters uh, five, six, and seven, you'll know that this is the first uh, recorded sermon that Jesus um, preached, and um, it takes place right after his baptism, right after uh, the temptation, and this is the first one where it's actually um, recorded that that we see here, and that's and we're going to kind of focus on these probably next couple of weeks and work through some of the different aspects of, uh, of this sermon. This is known as the Sermon on the Mount is what this is. And, um, and it encompasses a lot of different aspects and a lot of different things are, are kind of contained with this, in this. And there's a lot of practical advice too that Jesus gives people um, in, in this uh, sermon here. But it all began back in chapter 4 really. And it's uh, one verse here that I want us to pay special attention to and want us to actually remember as we go throughout this uh, little sermon series or as we go out um, even just whatever we're doing or however we're relating to the Bible is I want us to pay attention to Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. It says this. It says, From that time on Jesus began to preach, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And we have to remember that but it really doesn't matter what else we have to say or what else we, we want to do or however, how else we want to uh, carry the gospel. The first thing that we got to keep in mind is, is Jesus' main message was for us to repent. And the reason we need the repentance is because the kingdom is near. And think about as near as the kingdom was in Jesus' day, how much nearer is it now? How closer are we now than, we, than they were then? And, but that basic message was us, for us to repent. Because if we don't have repentance, then we don't have anything else. It doesn't matter what else we do, what else we say, how else we do things. If we have not repented, it's kind of uh, it's almost like we're just we're just um, casting a fleece out there, and it, it's just wasted. Because without repentance, there is nothing else. There's no other. Um, you can't go any further until you have actually repented of your sins. Paul himself said this in First Corinthians chapter two, verse two. He says, "For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you." except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. In other words, what Paul's saying there is he says, I preach Christ and Christ crucified. He says, I'm preaching you the message of repentance because the purpose of Christ's crucifixion and His resurrection is a way of repentance. And when we repent, we have a way through Jesus. And, and, and so as we're kind of digging into this this morning and then maybe probably tonight and then probably even next week as we start to dig into these, I want us to think about the repentance in our own lives. Have we repented? Have we repented of our sins? Have we repented and, we, and, and, desire, and, and do we desire to follow Jesus? Or are we just kind of going through the motions of things and wanting to do things uh, just kind of halfway? We're halfway in, halfway out and wanting to kind of do things the way that we want to do it because um, it, it, we can't go any further in our relationship with Christ until we have first repented of our sins. And I want, and I want to let you know too that you know if the Holy Spirit lays anything on your heart, if it, the Holy Spirit tells you you need to come and repent, then you need to come and you need to do that. And it doesn't matter if uh, if we're up here singing, if we're up here preaching, or what's going on. If the Holy Spirit's leading you to do it, then you do it right then and there. You don't wait for um, anything else to go 
on. You know, we talk about traditions and rules and different things, and we know traditionally at the end of the sermon that we have an altar call. You don't have to wait for that to be your invitation to come to the altar and pray. You come and pray when the Holy Spirit puts things on your heart, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, because what happens is the longer you wait and the longer you just kind of um, mull over it, what happens is it gives it gives Satan that time to kind of convince you otherwise, to kind of tell you something else, or to kind of uh, convince you, maybe, maybe you don't need to do that. No, you, you you respond to the Holy Spirit. Don't worry about what else is going on. Don't worry about what else any anybody else in here is doing at the time. You be responsive to the Holy Spirit. And that goes for today, tomorrow, anytime. You be responsive to the Holy Spirit. Because repentance comes first before anything else. And that's what I want us to kind of get in our mind this morning. Um, that, re- that repentance has to come first. Because everything I'm going to talk about here in Matthew chapter 7, everything I'm going to talk about in Matthew 5 and 6, um, you know, in other sermons, it does not matter. It's not going to make you a bit of difference if you have not first repented. And we need to understand that. And that's why when the first thing Jesus said there, the first thing he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The very first thing. So and that we need to keep that in mind. But like I said this morning, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 7 and we're going to be going through chapter, uh, verses 7 through 12. So if you can start looking for that in your Bibles. Before we get to that though, I do want to go back and back up a little bit and kind of set the foundation here um, back in verse 1 of that chapter. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 says this. And, and we hit on this a little bit last week. We kind of touched on it just a little bit. But Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 says this. It says, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He says, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Remember, I like to call it a two before. It says, How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? He says, You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. And we, and we hit on that last part of that, that, that passage last week and we talked uh, quite a bit about it, you know, the, uh, about just having kind of like a splinter in your eye and a two before and, and, and you've got to get rid of your two before before you can help somebody else get rid of the splinter that's in their eye. But I want us to focus this morning on the first two verses of that passage because we covered the rest of it pretty well. But again, it says this, Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And the, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And this is one of those core issues that kind of drives a wedge between people and God. Is that judgmental attitude that we sometimes have. And I'll to be honest with you, a lot of times we can't help it because that's part of our sinful nature. To be, and it's, it's kind of how we are um, how we're conditioned from birth is to be judgmental of other people is to judge others and to judge ourselves based on how we look compared to other people that's kind of something that, that our society and, and, um, and our world and, and that's just something that just comes out of us and, and, and the Holy Spirit has to, has to remove that from us if we're going to be able to be uh, functional and be able to be effective for the kingdom of God but, but that's kind of we find our self worth in comparison comparing ourselves to other people. And, but, and that's kind of crazy. Is like, why, why do we want to say, oh, well, I'm better than this person or I'm better than, who's, than that person? Because really when we're asking, whose eyes are we better than? Are in our own eyes? In their eyes? Whose eyes? You know, the world's eyes? Because it's, that's a worldly mentality that we've got to get out of. And, and the thing is, we, we, th- we think that that's going to get us somewhere, but the reality is there is not one single human being on this planet that is going to be judged according to the world's standards. You're going to be judged according to God's standards. You're going to be judged according to what God finds acceptable and what God finds unacceptable, not what the world finds acceptable and what the world finds unacceptable. So why are we comparing ourselves with other people, other sinful, flawed people, and trying to just get above them? Why are we not comparing ourselves to the standards that God has set for us? And those standards don't deal with how we look or, or, or you know, how we dress, how much money we have, how much power we have, how much authority we have. It deals with our heart. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, this is one of my favorite verses of the Old Testament. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks where? 
at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart. So when we're looking at things and we compare things like beauty and success and wealth and power or ability and all these different things, to God those things don't matter. Those are just pointless things to God. What matters is our heart. And the question is, is our heart right with God? There's our heart where it needs to be with God because that's what's going to make the difference. And, and, and Jesus tells them here, and he's talking about being judgmental, and he says, well, if you're going to be judgmental of people, if you're going to judge people, you better be judging them by God's standards because if you're going to compare yourself to them, you're going to be judged by God's standards. And he's also going to, he's telling them, and he's trying to get them to focus on their own heart because that scrutiny that we use when we judge other people, just think about if we're judged by the same standards as we judge other people, people how's that going to change how we look at other people think about that you know and in that scrutiny we're talking about i'm not talking about like um like making a checklist of sins you know like you know how santa claus will have a checklist of who's naughty and who's nice and and trying to figure it out god don't have a checklist of of who of who's naughty and who's nice god's checklist deals with what our heart's condition is like and, and one of the things that we have to keep in mind is a person's knowledge or experience and, and what they know about Christ to begin with. I'm going to read you something out of Luke chapter 12. It says, verse 48. It says, But the one who does not know and does things deserving punishment will be beaten with few blows. For everyone who has given, given much, much will be demanded. For mu- where much is given, much is required. You all remember that? This is what this says. It says, And from one whom has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And in other words, um, God's going to judge you based on what you know. God's going to hold you accountable based on what you know. And, and if you've been sitting here since 11 o'clock this morning, you already know that you must repent of your sin and that you must be right with God. Your heart must be right with God. So God is going to hold every one of you all accountable to that first and foremost. But we'll want to judge other people based on, on what we think they should know or what we think they should be acting or how we think they should be doing things. It's not how it works. It's how God perceives that and what God has taught them and how they understand things according to God's standards. You know, someone that's a new Christian does not know as much as someone that's been a Christian for 20 years. Or, or, well, let me put it this way. They shouldn't know as much. You know, someone that's been a Christian for 20 years, they may be just as immature or may not know a whole lot either, just to be quite honest with you. But the way it works is they should not know as much. So you can't judge a person who just got saved yesterday based on the same standards as somebody that just got, that's been saved for 20 years. You can't do it because they don't know as much. They have to learn. The Holy Spirit has to teach them. And think about us. How long has it taken the Holy Spirit to teach us some things? Particularly if you're stubborn like me, it takes a little bit longer too to learn some things because you want to you want to kind of fight against it but think about all the things in our lives that the Holy Spirit has taken from us and how long did it take for some of those things for the Holy Spirit to take those things from us it takes time you know some all things are not just going to be boom magically taken away we have to learn we have to grow we have to mature and we can't go out here and start judging people based on the fact that they don't know as much as what we know or they're not as mature as what we think that we are but I'm just going to tell you if we're judging people like that we're not as mature as what we think we are either and we need some work ourselves. And that's, that's what Jesus is doing. And he's trying to get them into this mindset and get them to understand these, these concepts because he, he's wanting them to, um, to realize that, that God's kingdom is not an earthly kingdom, that God's kingdom is not based on earthly standards and based on the things that we, un, we understand. And, and we've got to get the two before out of our own eyes so that we can see God clearly. And so we can see to do the things that God's called us to do. And that kind of brings us up to where we're going to pick up this morning. That brings us up to our scripture this morning. So if you found Matthew chapter 7 verse 7 in your Bibles, I invite you to stand with me if you're able to. If you're not, don't worry about it. But I'm going to read just two verses and then we'll get right into it this morning. It says here, Matthew chapter 7 verse 7. It says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be opened. Father, we come this morning and I just thank you for this time and your word. And I just ask you now to be with us and just help us today. Father, help me with this word and just uh, give me the words to speak, Father. And just uh, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. I just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for standing. Now you'll notice there that it's three things there. And it sounds really good. Ask, seek, knock. 
and, and we kind of take that and we want, to, we, we want to use that and we'll say, oh, man, if we look at that, we're going to get whatever we ask for, right? Everything's going to go our way. All we got to do is ask and we're going to get everything just the way we want it. Don't that work that way, does it? If it worked that way, we'd all be rich, wouldn't we? Ain't would nobody ever get sick, would they? Everybody in the world would be a Christian, wouldn't they? So why, if it don't work that way, why does Jesus say that? Why has Jesus said that here if it doesn't work that way? Well, the problem is not with what Jesus is saying. The problem is with our understanding of what Jesus is saying. Because we have misunderstood, once again, what Jesus is saying in His very Word this morning. You know, we, we, we want to interpret, interpret this and, and, and kind of use it as a, kind of like a magic spell. And we can cast this magic spell on the world and then we can get whatever we want just as long as we, we say the exact right words or we do the exact right thing. There is no magic spell here. You can't cast a magic spell on God and get whatever you want. You can't manipulate God and get whatever you want. Guess what? God created all of us, right? How do we think that we can manipulate the God that created all of us to do what we want God to do? It's not about what we want. It's about what, what we need. And you know, pro- and the problem is not with the people who have misunderstood this verse. It's how they've been being taught this verse. It's how they're being taught these things. And, uh, and I'm not talking really so much about the teaching that you receive in the church because most churches do a pretty decent job. But what I'm talking about is all this uh, um, self-help junk that's out there. That's what I call just self-help junk. And this um, pop psychology, I call it, it's, uh, you know, it's just all oh, make you feel good stuff is what it is. This, um, this prosperity gospel stuff, all this stuff that's out there. And, and what they'll do is these ones that are, that are pushing these things, what they're pushing is an agenda so that they can line their pockets. That's what they're pushing. And it's, they're just wanting to line their pockets with things and they're not really wanting to help people with the gospel. They're not really wanting to help people with God's words. And what they'll do is when things don't work out the way that they, that they say they should work out, who they blame? They'll blame you. They'll say, oh, no, you just didn't have enough faith. You ever heard that? You didn't sow your seed enough. Or, no, you must have sinned to cause God to punish you for that. That's a bunch of garbage. I'll just tell you, that's just a bunch of garbage. Let me read you something out of Scripture here. John chapter 9, verse 1 says this. As he went along, this is Jesus, he says he saw a blind man from birth. It says his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see what they're doing here? This is a guy who's been blind since he has been born. And they had, they had it drilled in their head that, that all sickness, all disability, and all these things are a result of somebody's sin. Now, what do we know about God? What's God's nature? Love, right? We, we realize that. Now, how can a loving God... Punish somebody for somebody else's sins. It would be like God punishing Dale for my sins. That'd be all right. I could get away from anything. <laughs> but that's the concept there. But it, we have that concept too. We still have that because we think about, well, what did they do to, to get that? You know, We will think in those terms, those punitive terms. Now, I'm not going to tell you that there's not consequences to your sins. If you do things, there's going to be natural consequences to that. You know, there are some diseases that go along with doing things that you shouldn't do. Things like if, you're, if, if, if you drink all the time, chances are you're going to end up with cirrhosis of the liver. Those kinds of things. If you smoke 10 packs of cigarettes a day, chances are you may end up with lung cancer. All these different things are consequences of that. But that's not God saying, I'm punishing you for doing that. That's just a consequence because I guarantee you God has warned you time and time again to stop or you're going to end up with that consequence. And that's the difference there. So there's consequences. But this guy, he has been blind from birth. Now this a little baby from birth can't see. Now how can a little baby from birth sin? They've not had the opportunity to sin yet. They've just been born. And so they've got that mindset. So in their Jewish tradition, it's like, well, then he's paying for the sins of his parents. No. No. Jesus says this in verse 3 of that chapter. It says, Neither this man or his parents have sinned. It says, But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. 
As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. He says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, that's a hard pill to swallow right there a little bit. It's it's difficult to understand. It's difficult to understand that people are sick, that people um, have disabilities and different things that go on in their lives, and God is glorified by it. Because I'll guarantee you, uh, looking around, if you've been sick, you don't feel like God's very glorified in it, do you? None of us do. We don't feel that way. And we don't, uh, we don't kind of understand that and uh, how that all works. It, it's, it's hard for me to even talk about sometimes because I can see, you know, in my own life and my family's life and how they've been sick. I've not wanted them to be sick. I, you know, God can be glorified some other way is what we want in our mind. Don't you all think? You all agree with that. I don't want people being sick. But it's not about the sickness. It's about what comes from that. It's how we react to it. And, and, and I can't answer the questions as to why people get sick the way they get sick. I can't answer those questions because I'm not God. I, I'm not even going to try to answer those questions. You know, I can't answer why Dale had lung cancer. I can't answer why Donna had to have a liver transplant. I can't answer those questions. I don't know. The only thing I do know is what God's Word says is, is, that, is that in some way if we stay true to God, God will be magnified and God will be glorified through it and we'll be, we'll be eventually glorified ourselves through it. It's the only thing I know. That's all I got, folks. It's, I can only go with what God's Word says. But it says this. It says as long as it is day or as long as we can endure, we must do the work of Him that sends us. As long as we can, we must continue to do the work of God. We must continue to live for God. Because all of this is temporary anyway. And we've got to keep that in our mindset too. We see things just kind of straight in front of us. Just that, that temporary, that thing right in front of us. God sees all eternity. And we have to keep all that in mind. And we have to keep that um, going in the back of our mind here. It says as long as it is a day, we must do the work of Him that sends us. It's because there's coming a time when no one can work. There's going to come a time when the work's going to be done, when the work's going to be over, and there is no more work to do. But we have to endure. I don't know why we have to endure the things we have to endure, but we just we have to endure. Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us this. It's just talking about faith. It says, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And see, our hope and our faith is in Jesus. Our hope is in, is in heaven. Our hope is in our future. Our hope is not here, really. It's not in this life. It's not in this planet. It's not in this town. Our hope is in Christ. And that's what we gotta, we've got to keep our minds set on. So... The next time something, something bad happens and somebody tells you that, oh, you just didn't have enough faith. Well, you better not do what I was thinking. I was going to say, just reach up and slap them. <laughs> but you probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> that's, what I'm, that's what you feel like doing. It has nothing to do with your faith. Absolutely nothing to do with your faith. It's got nothing to do with any kind of sin or anything. Those things happen. They just happen. And it's how we respond to those things. That's part of uh, our life is just bad things happen. And, and we, have to, we have to learn how to respond to those things. And don't go out here and slap somebody and tell them your preacher said to slap them. But. <laughs> so I said, no, don't do that. <laughs> but Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. It looks like we're going to get started with this, but we ain't going to finish it this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 says this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. Now we read that and some of us will say, okay, I'll go and I'll ask. I'll go and I'll seek. I'll knock. Then we quit. Now when you translate that verse out, it means to ask and keep asking. It means to seek and keep seeking. It means to knock and keep knocking. You ask until you get an answer. You seek until you find the God that you're seeking. And you knock until He opens the door. And that's what it means. It's ask, keep asking, keep seek, keep seeking, knock, keep knocking. 1 Chronicles 16 11 says this. It says, look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. 
Don't say seek his face one time and get up and go home. It says seek his face always. Psalm 105, 4 says the exact same thing. Look to the Lord in his strength. Seek his face always. Are we, are we always seeking God's face? Are we just kind of, eh, I'll go, man, then I'm now. We've got to constantly be seeking God's face. We've got to constantly be asking. We've got to constantly be knocking. And God, does, and we think, well, I can't do that. I'll be, I'll be aggravating God or I'll be getting on God's nerves. No, you won't. That's a human mindset, thinking about things. God says, ask, knock, seek. That's what He tells us to do. He also tells us this. Let me find it. Ephesians 3.12, it says, um, In Him and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Freedom to approach God through Jesus. And we have that freedom to approach the God that created this whole universe through Jesus. In Hebrews 4.16, uh, the NIV reads this way. It says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Now, I like the King James translation a whole lot better because it's more forceful. It says, Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace. You hear that? Boldly come to God. It says, And that we may have turned mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Now you'll notice it doesn't say that we're going to get what we want, does it? It says we will obtain mercy and we will find grace. Not to fix the problem, but to help us in that time of need. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't say that God's just going to magically fix everything. It says that we obtain His mercy and His grace and His help to help us get through that time. Romans 5.3 says this, Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Those, these things that sometimes we just have to, we have to endure. It produces that hope in Christ. It says this in verse 5, And hope does not disappoint us. That hope is Jesus. You can, you can take the word hope out and put Jesus there. And Jesus does not disappoint us. Because God has poured out His love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom He has given to us. And then verse 8 of our text says this. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And him who knocks, the door will be opened. And we don't know exactly what God's answer is going to be, do we? But I guarantee you He'll answer you. We don't know how God's going to see if, when we open the door, when He opens the door, but we know He's going to open it. And if it's from God, then it's a good gift. Even though we may not understand it. It says all, th- you know, all things are, that come from God are good. And the last part here, Jesus, um, He explains this to them a little bit. In verse 9 he says, Which is you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And I really like Luke's translation. He says, How much more will your Father give you the Holy Spirit to those who ask? But what he's talking about there is our trust in God. And we can use this, think about it in our own terms. If, we, if, we, if our kids come to us and they're hungry, and you know, we're eating a big old sandwich, and they want a sandwich, we're going to hand them a rock and say, here, chew on this. Or if we're having a big old catfish dinner, and they come and say, hey, can I have some of that? We're going to hand them an old rattlesnake as they eat it. Jesus says, even you and your fallen, sinful nature know how to do good, know how to show compassion, know how to show love, even though you're fallen, you're sinful, and your first nature is to look out for number one. You know how to be nice to other people. You know how to do those things. He said, how much more then is a father whose very nature is love Willing to do that for his children. How much more willing is God to care for our needs than even we are 
That's all he's saying here. John 14, 18 says this. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Then the last part of Matthew 28, 20, it says, Surely I am with you always to the end of the very age. Or the very end of the age. Then Matthew, or Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, The Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I wonder if, if we can say that this morning. I wonder if we've got folks here this morning that have thought about just giving up. It's been done with it all. I tell you, don't give up. Matthew 24, 13 says this. He who stands firm to the end will be saved. He who endures to the end will be saved. So we don't need to give up. We need to ask and keep asking. We need to seek and keep seeking. We need to knock and keep knocking. The first thing we need to do, though, is we need to repent, and we need to keep repenting. Because none of us are perfect. None of us have it all worked out. So I'm going to ask you, stand with me if you don't care. Do you all care to come? And get a song ready. I'm going to ask you this morning, is there anything that stands in the way of you being where God wants you to be this morning? Is there any kind of barrier, any kind of block between you and the Lord this morning? If there is, come and put it on the altar and get that block removed. Or maybe if you're here and you're just worn out, you need to be renewed. Come and do that. Or maybe you need to ask a little more, seek a little more, knock a little more. And I can't guarantee you that you'll get the answer that you want. I can guarantee you that God will be with you regardless of what the answer is that you get. So I'm going to give you that opportunity as they sing this morning. You all just be obedient and be responsive to the Holy Spirit. Father, we come and thank you for this time that you've given us. I ask that you bless and you be with each family that's here today, Father. That you help them, Father. Those that are that are sick, Father. Those that are just having a hard time physically. Those that are just having a hard time in general today, Father. I'm just going to ask that you touch them, that you help them today, Father. And just uh, be with all of our families, all of our veterans, Father. Be with all the ones who have a special need and a special issue, the things that are going on in their lives, Father. And we're just going to thank you today. We just know and we're just going to place these things squarely in your hands. And we just give you all glory for the things you've done and the things that we know that you will do this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.